Hi class, and welcome back. I apologize for the delay, um, but we're gonna finish up all the outstanding material in the course today, and uh, it won't be that bad. We really just have two things left because we were so far ahead. So we have to cover the Horevich theorem and fiber sequences. Uh, my plan for the rest of class is that we'll do that uh, in this lecture video, um, and I'm gonna post a final exam, which I've almost finished preparing today. Uh, the goal with this final exam is to demonstrate competence. So some of the questions, um, you know, competence across primarily the this semester's material, but uh, my hope is that if you pass this exam, you would be able to sit down and solve um, a prelim exam in algebraic topology at basically any uh, major PhD program across America. So, you know, I think everyone should feel well accomplished. So, um, I'm gonna post another video next week, uh, which will, will be a little bonus lecture. Um, the focus of it will be, uh, I'll give an introduction to what a spectral sequence is, which is a very important computational tool, not just in Al, you know, in homotopy theory, but uh, it also comes up in a couple other related region parts of algebraic topology. I know in um, uh, floor uh, homotopy theory or floor uh, homology, people use spectral sequences all the time to do computation. So uh, this is kind of a standard place where you can start to introduce them. Um, and we'll see that we actually already have seen a couple baby spectral sequences in a couple arguments that we've done throughout the course and last semester, but this is a good time to start seeing how they can be complicated. Um, and we'll talk about the Serre spectral sequence, which is a spectral, spectral sequence associated to a fiber sequence, um, and it'll tell us uh, some pretty excellent uh, computational results. So it'll be a fun little toy, prod, toy uh, example to see. Uh, that will hopefully, you know, provide some impetus for further study. So let's focus first on the Horevich theorem. Um, I should note that uh, I was taught to pronounce this Horevich, uh, but I've definitely heard people say Horowitz and Horewitch and just giving up on pronouncing it properly, uh, and I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing it properly. I think it's Polish, but yeah. So, I, just warning, when I say Hurevich, this is the name I mean. Uh, so, what does the Hurevich theorem say? Uh, we take a space, and this is, this is the standard way that most people remember this theorem. If you have a space, which is n minus 1 connected, and n has to be at least 1, so I'm saying at least this is a, uh, so if n is 2, it's one connected space that's simply connected. So it has to be at least be simply connected. Then there's a Horevich homomorphism, which we'll introduce, uh, that tells you that, which is a map from pi n, so in the first degree where x have a, a homotopy group, pi n, you have a map from that to the nth homology of x, and it turns out to be an isomorphism in that degree, in degree n. And furthermore, all of the degrees below n, both the homotopy groups pi i are zero because uh, x is n minus one connected, and the reduced homology groups are zero, which means that the only homology that x will have, that space will have, is in degree zero, and then the next, the first homology group, uh, or uh, the first one that is non-zero will be hn, and then above that degree, you know, question mark on what's happening in homology and a question mark on what's happening in homotopy groups. But in the first degree where this a space with sufficient connectivity has homotopy groups, it has the same homology groups, and then they get more complicated. So uh, you should be thinking in the back of your head about x being a sphere, an n-sphere, uh, and then, indeed, pi n of Sn is z, which is also the same as hn of Sn with, with integer coefficients. Uh, and I'm suppressing integer coefficients everywhere. Um, so 
maybe just as remark, h is going to be h n with coefficients in z. Yeah. Uh, and then it turns out that the higher homotopy, the higher homology groups of S n are zero, but the higher homotopy groups uh, of S n are complicated. Uh, they tend to, in general, be z mod two or whatever. So you have agreement in this degree, and then. And they're both zero below this degree, and then uh, above that degree, they kind of veer off and can vary. So this is the structure theorem that Horavich, the Horavich theorem gives you. There's also a relative version for the Horavich theorem, so I'm going to state that here, and then we're going to kind of prove things. So the relative version takes x comma a a pair, um, and I want the same connectivity and minus one connectivity, so this pair has relative homotopy groups starting in degree n, and then that nth degree relative homotopy group is the same as the nth degree relative homology group. They're an isomorphism, and in lower degrees, uh, so when i is less than n, you will have that all the relative, oh, sorry, just homology groups, they're always relative because it's a pair, um, are, uh, that I'm saying I don't need to reduce them, right? because it's a pair, so the homology groups for the pair vanish in degrees below that, like how the homotopy groups vanish for the pair in degrees below n. Uh, additionally, you do need this requirement that A is simply connected and non-empty, um, and we'll see where this comes up in the proof. And uh, I think that's about it. Uh, you can clearly recover um, this upper form of the theorem by setting a equal to x0, which is simply connected and not empty, uh, and you'll get back the, um, this version. And since n is bigger than 1, h n of x comma x0 is the same as reduced homology of, of x, which is the same as the unreduced homology of x. So that's what's happening there. Okay, um, so I think there should be two questions that you have, and I'm first going to address the maybe less likely question, which is this n bigger than 1 question. So what happens if you have a space which is, in fact, n equals 1 connect, uh, uh, n equals 0 connected, right? So n equals, ugh, if n equals 1, what we know is that x comma a or x will be zero connected, which means x is a path connected but not simply connected space, so it has interesting pi 1. In general, in that case, you don't know that the first homology and the first and the first homotopy group agree because uh, pi 1 of x uh, is not necessarily abelian, uh, and we'll address this, but we, but we know that uh, the map from pi 1 of x to uh, uh, h1 of x uh, is the abelianization map. Right, so you can view h1 of x as pi 1 of x ab. Uh, and that's, but this is definitely not an isomorphism in general, you just have this map, and it turns out this is the Horavich map in this degree, uh, and we'll come back to this, uh, but it turns out you can do a little bit more, so if, additionally, x has a, uh, universal cover, So that means that I've got an x twiddle living over x uh, with some fiber, which is a collection of points. So the fiber above x naught living down here, uh, uh, right, p inverse of x naught looks like uh, a disjoint union of a fi uh, discrete set of points. Uh, how do I want to 
right? This it's just a bunch of copies of X, not uh, discreetly indexed because uh, they look like a fiber upstairs. That's a discrete space, uh, and what we've said is that uh, previously is that P uh, induces an isomorphism. Pi I of X twiddle is going to be isomorphic to pi I of X as long as I is bigger than or equal to degree 2. And so in degree 1, we know that the universal cover has... Uh, uh, no fundamental group. It is simply connected, right? But then in the higher degrees, they all agree because the fiber has only uh, points in it. And we'll kind of revisit this later in this lecture when we talk about fiber sequences. Um, so I'm priming you for that. But uh, what this means is that we can apply the Horevich theorem to, uh, all right, let me see where my bounding box is, good. So, Horevich, uh, Horevich, for x twiddle implies that uh, h2 of x twiddle with integrator coefficients is isomorphic to pi 2 of x twiddle, which we also know is the same as pi 2 of x. So in this case where x is path connected but not simply connected, if it has a universal cover, drop my pen, uh, if it has a universal cover, then you can still use the Horevich theorem to tell you about pi 2 of x provided you can compute the second homology of the universal cover which you can hope is easier to compute, even though it's often still kind of hard to work with. Um, but this gives you a computational approach to uh, get pi 2 of x. So, uh, okay. Um, but let's now prove the theorem in general uh, and answer the more important question, what is this map H? So what is the Horevich map? Oh, uh, let's define it in the relative case. So in that case, we want H to go from pi n uh, of x comma a comma x naught to h n of x comma a uh, just x comma a always based. Um, so what do we do? So if I have uh, an element here is a homotopy class of maps uh, and it's homotopic relative that like complicated relative boundary, but I can think of f as being a map from uh, d n, uh, the n disk, uh, relative its boundary, uh, relative some base point, uh, let's say just little d, zero, for the base point, uh, to x, comma a, comma x not. Uh, and it's a homotopy class of maps where the homotopy has to fix uh, the, um, uh, is allowed to move this dn coordinate, uh, but not these coordinates, um, or part of these or whatever, right? So it's, this is what a homotopy looks like, or this element f looks like, and in homology, I can look at uh, the induced map on, let's say, enthomology from the pair dn, boundary dn, to uh, enthomology of x comma a. So we're in homology, so f introduces a covariant map 
um, on homology groups. And this is the group Z because that is dn uh, mod its boundary, and we know that that's the same as the homology of the nth homology of Sn with integer coefficients. Again, we're always with integer coefficients. So uh, pick a generator. Uh, so fix generator for um, Hn of Sn, uh, and I'm going to call that uh, Z generated by uh, an element alpha. Then, uh, and I guess, yeah, why not? Uh, alpha. That looks good. So called alpha. Then, uh, what I can do is just take this map sends alpha to something interesting, f star alpha over here. <laughs> And that's what I'm going to send f to. So uh, the class of f under the Horevich map h will be sent to f lower star of alpha. Um, and I'm going to fix this choice of alpha once. And then that defines the map for any uh, element f in this, in this homotopy class of maps. Um, so let's say if we have uh, a homotopic map, uh, so if we have map G and we have a homotopy uh, appropriately relatively, uh, let me write that this way. So we have, here's a homotopy uh, between these two things, between F and G, so that F, G's homotopy class is equal to F in the relative group. Uh, then that homotopy also induces, uh, tells us that F star and G star induce the same map on relative homology theories. Uh, so once we fix this choice of alpha, we know that F star of alpha is going to absolutely equal G star of alpha. So it's no real big surprise that um, this that the map H is well-defined. Um, maybe the surprise, though, is that in the correct degree, it makes sense uh, to, it in fact gives us an isomorphism. So you should notice that uh, this map is defined uh, for all N such that uh, the left side is a group. And so the interesting thing is that we get an isomorphism in a uh, certain range of degrees. So when they're both sides are zero, we're kind of getting a trivial isomorphism, but then we get this isomorphism in the first non-trivial degree. Uh, now I've, I've defined it, I've only really checked that the map is a map, but I said this is in fact a homomorphism of groups, uh, and we're going to use that. So let's just uh, state that as a lemma here. So uh, I don't know. Yeah. So proposition uh, H is a homomorphism of uh, groups, uh, and it's defined whenever n is uh, bigger than or equal to one. Bigger than I guess I can definitely define this bigger than or equal to one, but let's just say uh, abelian groups when n is strictly bigger than one. Uh, and when n equals one, it also works. Uh, it's a group homomorphism, but it's a little uh, more annoying to write down the notation, but the same proof will work. So uh, the only thing I really should be checking, well, we already checked it's well-defined, but we should check that, like, uh, if I have F plus G in my homotopy group, that is that H of this 
is h of f plus h of g. Uh, and that's really not that bad, uh, since f star uh, plus g star is equal to f plus g star on homology. Uh, so induced maps on homology were already uh, gave us group homomorphisms. Uh, and uh, in the other case, n equals 1, you would just need to check that f uh, composed with g star is the same as f star plus g star. Uh, and you're gonna get, you're gonna get a similar, uh, result, so. So this is just following from the foundation we built last semester on homology theories. So let's describe our strategy of approaching the proof, um, and you can either think of the case uh, x comma a, or x, n minus 1, connected, uh, and n is bigger than uh, 1. So what we know from our work on cellular replacement is that if you have a space whose homotopy groups only start existing after a certain point, you can replace that space up to homotopy equivalence with a CW complex, and the CW complex will only start having cells in uh, degree in dimension n. So uh, let's split this into kind of like two separate cases. So in this case, uh, that means I can replace x uh, by a CW complex uh, Let's just say it this way. We can uh, assume x uh, is a CW complex with uh, cells uh, in uh, degrees um, n uh, greater than or equal to n. Uh, aside from the base point. So we've got a cell structure where we put in a single point for the base point, and then our first cells are in degrees n. This means that instantly we get that h i of x is 0 for i strictly less uh, than n. And that's just following from CW homology. For the pair, we can assume, since A is non-empty, uh, that the pair XA um, uh, is a CW pair uh, with, um, uh, how should I say this, uh, so that uh, the difference, x minus a, only has cells in dimension bigger than or equal to n. All right, so uh, again, the, the key translation between this side and the red side and the blue side is that the blue side is just where a is the base point. So, um, yeah. So again, on the left-hand side, we know that the relative... Uh, homology of the pair uh, is zero in degrees below n from cellular homology. And now the key is to understand what happens in that degree, in that last final degree. Uh, and since we've already replaced things by cell structures, we're going to come up with an argument uh, using a little lemma about specifically what happens when we're attaching um, just n cells and uh, how that changes um, the structure of pi n. So let me state our key lemma. Okay, so here's the key lemma, and we should understand this lemma as we're trying to understand what pi n 
looks like after we add N cells. So, um, so I'll clear it. So I've got um, a CW complex X, um, and I'm adding, and it's just a different X. Well, yeah, uh, I'm adding N cells uh, indexed by alpha, and their N is here bigger than or equal to two. So I've formed this bigger complex W, and the result that we get is if pi one of x, which includes into pi uh, one of w, is an isomorphism. So if uh, so, this is the, this is the induced map from the inclusion, I should say. So if if on pi one this is an isomorphism, so the cells you attach didn't uh, break pi one, then uh, pi n of the pair w comma x is as a pi one x module free with basis given by the characteristic maps of the new cells. So here's the way in which I uh, would parse this in and make sense of uh, what's going on. So uh, let's just say notes. So one is if n is bigger than or equal to three, uh, the if statement is always true. So if we're adding three cells or four cells or five cells, etc., going up, pi one of x is just isomorphic to pi one of w. Uh, so we're just describing what pi n w come x looks like in that case. And only in the case n equals two do we have to um, uh, specifically care about uh, describing that. Uh, two is, uh, recall the action <coughs> of uh, pi one on pi n. And so what this looks like is if I have an element, uh, let's say f, in uh, pi n of w comma x, what does that look like? Well, it looks like some sort of map uh, of this whole thing into w uh, comma x. Uh, and there's some identifications on the boundary, so this is like my dn comma boundary dn pair picture for the map. Now, the action on pi 1, so if I also have, and let's just color code this, uh, let's say gamma in pi 1 x, then what I get to do is, uh, if you call the relative picture, um, I take wherever this boundary is going and I apply uh, gamma going out this way. So uh, if, yeah, so as I've written it, this works if uh, gamma starts and stops at uh, an element of um, base point, so maybe I should write it that way, so, yeah, um, let's rectify this, so if I have just an element of, uh, yeah, whatever, pi n x, uh, and, uh, f restricted to the boundary of dn, uh, is all just mapping to the base point of x, then, uh, this element starts and stops at x0, and so uh, this sort of concatenation makes sense because I'm just going from something that starts at x0 out to something at x0, and so you, you go all the way around. All these are like radially applying gamma, uh, and we're doing f in this center. Um, but additionally, if uh, it's actually a relative pair, um, so uh, more generally, If f is just in pi n w x, then all we really know is that uh, the boundary is going to x. So uh, each of these boundary, yeah. So like the uh, boundary of dn uh, gets mapped to something in x. And so what we can do is um, concatenate with a map with a uh, 
since X is um, path connected, uh, we'll be able to uh, concatenate uh, with a map, uh, sorry, a path from wherever like F on one of these boundary points. So let's just call this A. F uh, of A to um, X naught in X. And so this is now uh, an element gamma, which lives in pi 1X. Uh, and this tells you some sort of action. Uh, so what I should be saying is if, if I take uh, a homotopy of uh, kind of different paths, right? So like you look at, in the relative case, this whole outer boundary uh, and view that as a path. Uh, this is a path in X. Um, and since we can homotope it relative, uh, we can just homotope it with no um, restrictions on the starting point or ending point, all paths are homotopic to the constant path at x naught. And so you can use that homotopy to give you, so fill in that homotopy h here, where the outside is constant at x naught. Uh, so in other words, you've you've kind of taken, let's just scroll up a little bit more, basically out of space. Uh, you've taken this data of this path and uh, uh, and x naught over here, and I've just wrapped it around um, the outside of this square of f, and this gives me a new element in... Uh, in pi n w comma x, uh, and this is you know some action, right? So, uh, put another way, we're only really going to be able to specify the points in uh, the or the elements in w comma x up to this sort of like reindexing action. Let me try to be a little bit more clear. So, in particular, we actually know that these characteristic classes uh, live in uh, pi n w comma x, right? So each of these characteristic attaching maps is a map from dn relative boundary dn uh, because I'm attaching uh, an n cell. Uh, and what that does is dn goes to the cell it represents in w and the boundary goes to something in X, which it was attached along. And so what I'm trying to say is that uh, the class for alpha, or for um, phi, capital phi sub alpha, uh, is uh, definitely determines an element uh, in pi n w comma X, but it also determines a bunch of other elements. So it determines elements uh, in a coset. And that coset of elements look like take all of pi 1 of x and just uh, act on gamma alpha uh, via it, right? And so the question is really, I have to check that this action is uh, free. So each of these is generating a free copy of pi 1 of x. Uh, and that would then tell me that pi n of w comma x looks like just like a, a product. I mean, it looks like these classes, uh, but then uh, each one has like a pi 1x attached to it as an abelian group. So if I give the abelian group description, it looks like a bunch of a big giant product of pi 1x's um, indexed over these attaching maps. So let's prove this. So, uh, proof first of the lemma. Okay, so our proof. So, uh, notice first that uh, W mod X uh, is just a big wedge sum copy of SNs indexed by alpha. 
So let's just index those by alpha. Well, uh, we'll just do some cases. So case uh, one. So if x uh, is simply connected, uh, then uh, we already know that pi n of the pair, w rel x, is going to be isomorphic to pi n of the wedge sum of Sn alphas. Uh, and this right-hand side, this is uh, uh, free on um, the characteristic classes. Uh, or whatever the elements of the characteristic classes. So that, that looks fine, because uh, this looks like a big uh, direct sum over, over the alphas of z's. Right, and each of the generators here is this class, uh, phi alpha. Uh, square bracket. bracket. Okay. Um, so if, so the hard case is um, if, uh, so case two, uh, if pi one x is non trivial, so x is not simply connected, uh, then we get to assume. that uh, pi 1 x uh, to pi 1 w is an isomorphism. And so now I can look at uh, the universal covers of each of these spaces. So um, assume x has a universal cover. Uh, and since the pi 1s are isomorphic, I can Attach. I can get a W twiddle um, by attaching N cells to uh, X twiddle. So in particular, um, since uh, W is X union uh, EN alpha, for each of these en alphas uh, upstairs, I can pick this to be x twiddle union uh, e n uh, alpha twiddle. Uh, and so uh, what does that look like if I uh, pick some um, something for en alpha to attach to? So if I pick a map from dn to this boundary, uh, into x, which is, I'm just going to denote by having to do with the characteristic class, or the boundary of the characteristic class, or whatever, right, then um, I can lift that upstairs to the universal cover. Um, so, take lift, and then I'm attaching a cell along that lift up here. Uh, now, I probably don't have enough cells yet, uh, so let's think about how many different ways I could have lifted upstairs, right? So uh, uh, there are, in general, pi 1 uh, different copies uh, of this lift, right? So pi 1x acts on this lift to give you other lifts. So uh, any lift after we fixed, fixed 1 is uh, gamma times uh, that choice of lift. Uh, maybe I should really use E and alpha, I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, right, and let's just, let's just draw a picture so we can make sense of this. So uh, in particular, if like X was a circle, um, then we have this circle, S1. Upstairs, we've got R. Uh, right? And if I'm attaching, you know, some cells to this, so let's say I've attached, uh, this is now S1 wedge S2, so I've attached like a dumb two cell over here, um, then what I get upstairs, so this is, this is one of the cases that works for this theorem, right? Uh, upstairs is that I should be forming R 
but then for every possible lift, I need to attach that cell. So I attach a sphere here, and another balloon here, another balloon here, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and one for each possible lift at the point. So uh, I actually need to go up here and attach this uh, for along gamma. So let me add that gamma in. So this is now indexed over alpha and pi 1x. Uh, so the way to think about this is I'm attaching uh, the same n cells upstairs, um, one for each uh, possible lift of the n cell downstairs. So let me write that down. So attach uh, n cells to x twiddle for each lift of an n cell attached downstairs. And you get one for each gamma in pi 1. Um, so because they have the same fundamental group, uh, you get kind of the same lifting condition on both sides. So, okay, so uh, the whole point of passing to um, uh, universal covers is now the universal cover is simply connected, so I, I get to apply the previous case. Uh, so uh, um, I should use w, so w twiddle, uh, comma x twiddle. Um, x twiddle is simply connected. So I get to conclude that pi n of the pair w twiddle comma x twiddle is isomorphic to a free feeling group generated by uh, each of these um, each of these elements uh, phi alpha uh, uh, dot gamma. Uh, where alpha is indexed over our indexing set, uh, which I guess I never gave a name to, let's call it A, and gamma is in pi 1x, right? Um, oh, I see I'm way off of my page. Let me just fix that. Okay, that looks a little better. So let's um, go to the next page. Okay, but then we have a universal cover, so... Um, uh, Relatively, W twiddle, X twiddle is a universal cover for the pair WX, which implies that pi from the long stack sequence for uh, pairs, that pi N uh, of the relative pair um, W twiddle comma X twiddle is isomorphic to pi N of the pair w comma x, and our description of uh, the top thing without the pi, the action of pi 1x is now the same as the description of the bottom thing with an action of pi 1x, and so uh, you can now think of this as being a big uh, sum over alpha in A of uh, elements phi uh, of alpha, uh, and then they are a coset on a pi 1x. So as an abelian group, it looks something like that. Um, and uh, you can understand that gamma, the action of uh, gamma prime on gamma uh, dot uh, phi alpha is just gamma prime gamma acting on phi alpha. And so you, you end up with this, this sort of situation. Uh, and uh, because they were had isomorphic, uh, because the action um, on cells in the universal cover is free, because you have like one uh, element in the fiber for everything in pi one of x and the lifting correspondence, the whole Galois correspondence, uh, this tells you that you have a free action. So this implies that um, pi n of w comma x. Uh, uh, 
is a uh, free Pi 1x module uh, generated by the set uh, phi alpha alpha in A as desired. And now with that, we're ready to prove Horevich theorem. So uh, let us prepare. So uh, maybe one, I don't know, additional lemma is uh, in general. So regardless of uh, the inclusion in the previous case, um, if n equals 2, uh, previous lemma uh, set up, uh, but without any knowledge about what this map is from pi 1x to pi 1w, uh, we still get that pi n of the pair w come x is uh, 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 is generated by um, these elements and uh, gamma dot phi alpha for all uh, gamma in pi 1x. Uh, but we don't actually know, um, uh, so even if we don't know that uh, this, anything in particular about this map, we end up knowing something um, about it relatively. So uh, what is this proof? So n, n equals 2. So we're only adding two cells. Uh, but the two cells can now screw up the um, pi 1. Uh, but what we actually know is that um, if I take, um, let's say, uh, let x1 be the 1 skeleton of x, uh, then the pair x1 union e2 alpha uh, x1, uh, this emits a map into w rel x. Um, and so, uh, right, by, uh, by the map, this is coming from the map from x1 into x in both coordinates, but I'm attaching cells, because I know two cells have to be attached into the one skeleton, so I'm just kind of like teasing this apart. Uh, homotopy excision implies this map is surjective on relative uh, pi 2. So surjectivity on pi 2 means that uh, just understanding the action, what pi n looks like, um, or pi 2 in this case, uh, let me do this here. No, didn't write this great. Pi 2. Um, understanding what pi 2 looks like in this case uh, just amounts to understanding kind of what happens when you're attaching to the one skeleton and then the higher stuff uh, is fine. Um, so uh, so all we're gonna do is um, like the, fi the higher stuff can kill things in the two uh, the second homotopy groups and make it smaller but um, than what it was in the one skeleton union these particular extra two cells, because I can add relations to those two cells, but, um, uh, or new two cells in X, but the, you're kind of attaching the same stuff to both coordinates here, because I'm attaching stuff just to X1 on both of them, like on both sides. So anyway, uh, what we're gonna do is, um, just look at the universal covers for uh, these one skeletons. And so I end up knowing that uh, I can like do kind of the same argument. And by being slightly glib about this, you can still take the same, uh, if you just assume X is, um, is its one skeleton here. Uh, so I'm only really making the argument about the left-hand side. Uh, I can look at uh, its universal cover. Um, I can map this over to x1 union these guys on the right hand side and the uh, let's just call this uh, yeah we just 
need a new name. Um, let's just call this Y. Uh, and Y's universal cover is going to still look like X1's universal cover union um, uh, pi1 uh, of X1 uh, dot uh, these E to alpha index to like over all of these. So you have like these cosets of new disks that you're adding, um, which is the same uh, stories we looked at before. So um, yeah, it's certainly generated by these, but then uh, the fact that this is just a surjection on pi n, so let me, sorry, let me write this pi two, pi two, it's now a surjection, uh, means that it's generated by those, but some of them can die. So that there's some additional relations that we're not seeing. So the freedom is, is not guaranteed anymore. Um, and I'm being slightly glib about how to apply homotopy excision here, but uh, Hatcher walks through it. It's not particularly illuminating. So, I mean, this the fundamentals of this, this argument are still exactly the same, and they look like that picture of attaching balloons in the previous slide. So I think that's, that's the key thing to think about here is the lifting property. So let's prove Horevich. Uh, and I'm going to prove the general, the um, relative version. Uh, but you can always set a equal to x naught to to recover the um, the other version. So this is the normal version of work. Uh, so what's this going to look like? Uh, so first thing I'm going to just assume uh, by CW approximation that this is a CW pair. Uh, so we've replaced it appropriately uh, with. Um, all cells in uh, the difference in x minus a in uh, dimensions bigger than or equal to n. And I'm still assuming um, that a is simply connected in order to reduce uh, the sorts of like complications from that previous, previous uh, lemma about the pi 1 action. So just like with the lemma, things kind of break down into either, uh, into like two cases. So either n is bigger than or equal to three or n is equal to two. Uh, and the problem here is this means that pi one um, of the inclusion from a to x uh, is uh, automatically an isomorphism. Uh, and in this case, it uh, is not necessarily. So let's sort out how to deal with uh, the n greater than or equal to 3 case first, and then we'll do the n equals 2 case. Um, so since uh, we only really care about pi n, uh, we'll make one additional reduction. Um, so uh, we only care about pi n uh, of the pair. So uh, we're going to assume uh, both x and a, uh, although it's vice for x, right? That x equals x is n plus 1 skeleton. So um, because in particular pi n of x is isomorphic to pi n of x n plus 1. So I'm only going to look out at the degree where I've attached n plus 1 cells, and then I'm just going to make the argument there and stop. Um, right. Uh, and, you know, and, and same also for homology. By cellular homology, uh, we also know this. Okay, so let's consider the following diagram. Pause. Okay, so uh, my notation for this diagram uh, is that uh, I'm going to write uh, pi prime, pi i prime for the quotient of pi i by the smallest normal subgroup generated by the uh, relation gamma dot f minus gamma. So I'm trying to say that in pi uh, n prime, uh, gamma f equals f, uh, 
or whatever. So uh, here, gamma is, as before, an element of uh, pi 1 of the uh, of y in this pair, and f is an element of pi i. Um, so what we get is a commuting diagram. So because uh, h in particular identifies these elements in homology, uh, we know that uh, h will lift to a form of the Horevich homomorphism coming from this quotient group. So um, our goal will be to kind of factor through there and then uh, make sure that that's an isomorphism. So uh, let's look at this diagram. I have drawn down below. So what is this diagram? Uh, so this is coming from the Longzac sequence for the pair. Uh, x comma x n union a uh, and so is this last one so I know that the map uh, h goes from th the top to the bottom and I'm just factoring it through um, q h prime as described above and so this is going to be pi prime the other relative group um, and the fact that uh, H, uh, the naturality of uh, homotopy group construction means that the induced map H gives maps of these long Zach sequences for pairs. Um, so that all of this commutes. So this giant diagram commutes. And so we're now looking at uh, kind of the whole picture. So what do we want to be true? We want the right column to be an isomorphism. So what does our lemma give us? Uh, it gives us, we start over on this far left hand side. So we remember xn is xn plus one, so, or sorry, x is xn plus one. So uh, what we know is that uh, this group is in fact a free abelian group uh, generated by cosec classes of these attaching maps for the uh, n plus one cells because uh, x is acquired from uh, that smaller thing by attaching n plus 1 cells. Um, and so it looks the same as this, which then means that this map here is an isomorphism. Since uh, this bottom guy here, this is just um, a free abelian group uh, with uh, generators the uh, n plus 1 cells of x uh, minus uh, a, which looks the same as uh, the description above because I'm just attaching these cells, etc. So that column looks good. Um, so, sorry. First, we said that this top thing was an isomorphism, so that whole vertical thing is an isomorphism. And now let's look at the middle column. Uh, let me change colors to red. So in the middle column, we also get to use the same lemma. So uh, note here that pi 1 of a, or sorry, I mean pi 1 of the pair, uh, x rel a is trivial, uh, and uh, yeah, so, um, so we know that, um, pi 1a to pi 1, uh, x and union a, uh, is an isomorphism, uh, since, uh, n is bigger than or equal to 2, um, uh, from long exact sequence of uh, in homotopy groups for this, this pair, right? So we get to conclude um, that yo, we use the same lemma, and uh, this top guy is an isomorphism. The very top thing by that same lemma now is uh, a free abelian group 
on these generators, so is the middle guy. Uh, so this relation didn't add anything and or eliminate anything because it's free. Um, and that now is the same description as homology, which is the same as this description over here. Um, and now we're going to get this on the right-hand side. Uh, and in part, this is going to follow because uh, the rows are now uh, long Zach sequences. Uh, and since I'm going into map zero, this is a surjection. Ooh, let me switch colors again. These are all surjections. Uh, so it, a diagram chase is going to tell you that this is an isomorphism. Uh, and we uh, get to conclude things that, oh, yeah, that this is an isomorphism uh, since uh the uh if i require so all of these these top isomorphisms are all following uh if uh i require uh homotopy uh to fix the uh base point so in all these cases if you pass from x from a to the base point this uh this uh, becomes, the, the top identification becomes trivial. So um, in particular, because it has no pi one. So yeah, this is just kind of dumb. Um, I'm just dealing with these different coset representatives, basically by passing the pi prime. Uh, and then I'm happy. Uh, yeah. Now, I guess there's one more case to deal with. Uh, ugh have a space. I can do it in one page though. So uh, in yellow, my final case is if uh, n is 2. Uh, and then the thing that gets harder is this middle column. Um, and uh, the key thing that we'll focus in on here is this one, h prime. So if n equals 2, uh, the pi 1 map is not an isomorphism. So this this argument here fails. But we have this more general, so uh, pi 1 is not isomorphic for x a to x. Um, but what we can do is still use that secondary uh, formulation where I describe this as uh, generated uh, by the guy's gamma dot, um, dot f and uh, then there's additional relations, and the map is still going to be uh, an isomorphism. And the best way to see that is um, we know Hn is abelian, we know the target's abelian, we know the top is um, a group, an abelian group, uh, with some uh, interesting generators, uh, maybe some relations, but we know that uh, these go to a generating set for the homology classes downstairs. Uh, and so it's just kind of that I've relabeled my uh, generating set by whichever of these survive the, um, the identification, the action up here by pi one. So uh, after you kill the additional relations uh, imposed by like the pi one action uh, by going up, the skeleton one more degree, uh, that'll still, the image will still give you a generating set. And both of them kind of lined up in the same way. So you still get this, this isomorphism and the proof still follows directly. So we're good. I'm gonna put a little box here and move on to talk about fiber sequences. So let's talk about fiber bundles and I'm gonna use uh, the terminology that Hatcher uses. Uh, there's some slight variability to this in the literature, but it's pretty standard. So um, so the idea behind a fiber bundle is that there's uh, kind of, we've seen nice sequences of spaces giving rise to pairs. So um, if X and A were nice, then nice pairs, then A including into X going to X mod A gave um, a long Zach sequence in uh, 
homology or cohomology, uh, respectively. But we know this doesn't happen uh, in homotopy groups. Uh, and the reason why is excision uh, fails or only holds in a range for homotopy groups. So uh, you just can't get this sort of niceness. However, uh, we get a different type of sequence that does give long exact sequences in homotopy groups, and those are fiber bundles. So, but uh, fiber bundles... do give long exact sequences in homotopy groups. Um, and so a fiber bundle in general looks like uh, the following. You've got a base space. B is a standard terminology for base space. You've got a total space E. E is for total, I don't know. Uh, and uh, F is your fiber. Um, and in general, whereas up here the inclusion was nice, here this is the nice map. Uh, so I'm going to call that P. Uh, and we'll be very specific very shortly about what makes it nice. Um, but, uh, and the idea is that uh, P inverse of any point B in B uh, is homotopically constant. So uh, for any two points, B and B prime, P inverse of B uh, looks like the fiber looks like P inverse of uh, B prime. Uh, and those are homeomorphic. Uh, and furthermore, the path, a path between B and B prime uh, path from B to B prime uh, gives a homotopy uh, between these two spaces. Uh, in E, so inside of the total space. Uh, this might seem weird, but we actually have a whole bunch of uh, canonical examples. Um, so uh, uh, the first example is uh, just let E, your total space, be F cross B, and P is the projection. Onto the base space B. Um, then uh, P inverse of B is just equal to the space you might call F cross B, and that's the same everywhere. And uh, if you draw a picture of the Cartesian product. So if this is my picture of E, and it's uh, this is the B direction, here's the F direction, then uh, at any two points downstairs, so here's uh, this point B, and here, here's this point B prime. So let's make B go the whole distance, yeah. Uh, then here's your fiber, and here's your other fiber, uh, so here's, uh, yeah, and, um, right, and here's your map P going down, uh, and you can see that the, uh, the homotopy between these guys is giving a way to fill, uh, this into a homotopy upstairs between these two different fibers. Um, so this is, like, the dumb, the, uh, trivial fiber bundle is a, just a product. And so, in general, people think fiber bundles uh, are twisted products. Okay, so um, to best see that, let's give two more examples. Um, so the next example is uh, one 
that everyone remembers from last semester uh, is universal or just covering spaces. So for covering spaces, the fiber looks like a discrete collection of points. Uh, so uh, it's some discrete set. Uh, and E was your covering space. For B. Uh, and so recall, um, for instance, for S1, we had like, uh, you know, we had these different like sort of uh, helisoid sort of um, whoop, covers where this was maybe the exponential map or mapping down, right? And your uh, fiber over uh, two different points. So let's, I'm going to give them like that. So it might look like this, these four points versus these four points. But clearly, if you have a uh, path between them downstairs, you're, you get these lifts upstairs, which in fact tell you how to um, map from one point to the other. And we said, actually, if you pick, you know, some weird path, so if you pick uh, the path that goes like that around, then this lift will send this guy to this guy, and this guy to this guy, and this guy to this guy, and this guy back down to this guy, because, uh, and I'm only going to draw one of these, because the lift for this red dot in particular goes like, wee, um, right, because of path lifting. Um, so that's uh, one good example uh, of place to, to dwell on. Uh, and in fact, we've already said that uh, pi uh, i of your covering space um, is already isomorphic to pi i of the base, provided uh, i is bigger than or equal to 2. Um, and that's because in this long exact sequence, pi i of the discrete set is just equal to f in degree 0 and nothing above. And so you're getting all these isomorphisms. Uh, and I've said in degree greater than or equal to 2 because, of course, in degree 1, things are something's happening because there can be interaction with uh, this degree 0 part of the long exact sequence from the connecting homomorphism. The next example I want to give is um, uh, the Mobius band. Uh, how should I say this? Mobius. Should I write with this? Mobius uh, band. So um, I should think of the Mobius band. So let's draw a picture of it. I'm pretty bad at drawing it. Um, I think uh, you, draw, you draw the cross, then you make it kind of connect, uh, and then something like like that. No, I still don't love that. Uh, I know you draw the cross first, so let's draw the cross. Uh, and then uh, this connects around here, and this uh, connects around like that. Something like that. Looks like the Mobius band. Uh, great. So this is my total space. And you should think of this as a uh, Uh, cover um, as a fiber bundle over S1, uh, your base, and uh, here's my copy of S1. And I'm going to draw it upstairs as well, so you can see, uh, like, I'm thinking of S1 as being the uh, center point section, and P uh, collapses all of these points to the center line. Um, that defines a map down, and the fiber is the homotopical fiber over any point. So what you should think is that I'm taking uh, the map from the single point space in 
to one of these points that classify as a point. So here's a map here, uh, which classifies that point. And uh, the fiber makes this uh, map commute. Um, so uh, if I write this as P inverse of X, um, the fiber is now uh, the interval I. So uh, if we make it closed, that works, right? So um, upstairs, you've got uh, all of this many points to get mapped downstairs to one point. And as you move around, uh, there is a twisting that occurs where if you do a one-fold uh, loop, so if you take a generator alpha up here, uh, then you can see that the map from uh, this copy of uh, the interval after you kind of like you can walk each of those lifts around and it'll send that point here to this point down there and this point here to the point up on top. So it in fact ends up sending, uh, if I write it up, it sends it to the downwards oriented one. So it's the map, uh, yeah, sending this point to there, this point to there, and this point to there. So it's the reflection through the midpoint. Um, and that is, of course, a homeomorphism uh, of the fiber with itself. There's one more good example, which is the uh, Hopf maps. So in particular, remember the one for uh, S3. So this arises from thinking about S3 as being the uh, unit sphere in R4, which is abstractly isomorphic to C2. And then you think about this as being C, uh, P, C, P, 1. And so inside of C2, there's a map to CP1, which is uh, mod out by scalar multiplication um, for everything uh, uh, minus the origin, so minus zero, right? Uh, and the fiber over each of, uh, each of those points looks like S1 um, because this looks like the uh, units inside of the complex line, or uh, yeah, inside of the complex line. So uh, this is a good example, and it gives a um, long exact sequence in pi star that looks something like this. So um, pi, uh, let's just go pi s1 to pi i s3 to pi i s2 uh, to dot 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 to uh, pi um, 2 s1 pi 2 s it's not an s s3 pi 2 s2 pi uh, 1 s1 pi 1 s3, pi 1, s2. Uh, and that's a reasonable spot to stop. Uh, and in this long exact sequence, uh, because uh, by cellular approximation, we know that pi i of sk is 0 if i is less than k, strictly less than, uh, we know that these guys are 0, they're trivial. Uh, we know that this is a copy of z. We know that this is a copy of z, and in fact, we know that the map from s2 to uh, pi 2 s2 to pi 1 s1 has to be an isomorphism because it's in particular uh, a surjection from z to z, which means it's also, because um, z is free, uh, an injection. So uh, it has to be an isomorphism. Uh, so that's using the fact that it's, uh, that this is part of a long sex sequence. So I'm looking at the next map going into zero there. I don't actually 
need to know what the connecting map in this long Zach sequence is to know that isomorphism. Uh, so that then tells me, oh, well, this I just know is zero, and this is zero, and so is this for all future zeros. So this is always now mapping into zero for i uh, strictly bigger than uh, three. Uh, and now these are isomorphic, uh, which in fact captures one of those details that we talked about in the homotopy groups of spheres, that S3 and S2 have the same homotopy groups in every dimension, except in the very lowest dimensions, where there's this shift of the Z up one. So what is it that makes fiber bundles, or how do we define a fiber bundle? Because the definition so far is not great. Um, so it's going to be a special property of that projection map P in the fiber bundle that tells us it's a fiber bundle. Um, and the following uh, is what you need. So um, I'm going to define this auxiliary definition. Uh, and this is often called the uh, homotopy lifting property or homotopy lifting. So we say that um, a map, uh, let's just call it P, satisfies the uh, homotopy lifting property with respect to um, a space X fixed, part of the data of the homotopy lifting property. Then uh, uh, for all uh, homotopies, h from um, x cross i to the base space. Uh, so uh, I'm going to specifically write um, I don't know. So uh, let's just call f h uh, restricted to x cross 0. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, so then for all of these, uh, for every, um, uh, I don't know, for all of these and, uh, for a map, uh, F twiddle mapping from, uh, X cross zero to E, uh, lifting F, there exists a lift of H from X cross I to E. Uh, and if that is just convoluted to follow, the following diagram is, uh, is all you need. So for every outside square, X cross zero, uh, this is the canonical inclusion to X cross uh, I, Here's H, here's F twiddle, uh, here's P, it's going to be P, don't like how I wrote P, let's try that again. Uh, there exists, uh, and then it's the same diagram, so let's just copy all of this. Uh, so for all of this, such that this all commutes, which means that F is a lift of uh, F f twiddle is a lift of f, right? So f twiddle of p is f. Then uh, there exists this h twiddle still making this commute. Um, so sometimes people just consolidate this down into remembering just this one uh, diagram on the right. So maybe what you could say is uh, uh, for all solid commuting diagram, there exists dotted uh, fills. So you can fill this like upper diagonal lift of H. Uh, okay. So uh, let's just make sure that uh, these things make sense.
Oh, sorry. Uh, let's let's additionally define what a fiber bundle is. So uh, definition: um, a uh, vibration. And I'm gonna note that this is a Hurevich vibration. Uh, is a map P B to B with the homotopy lifting property for all spaces X. So we have an example uh, already. So uh, the map, the projection map from the trivial product uh, is a vibration. So you just look at the data of what it constitutes. So F cross B down to B, this is the projection. If I have some map from X cross I in and X cross zero, it's mapping via, uh, I'm just gonna call it F twiddle, uh, upstairs, um, then uh, you should look at um, uh, F twiddle. And F twiddle, you can just write uh, by also projecting onto um, F. So let's just call this uh, PF, right? Um, F twiddle uh, is really, you can write it as like uh, F twiddle F comma F twiddle uh, B, right? So by projecting, like, it, it, what is it doing in each coordinate? Uh, it has coordinate functions, one on F, one on B. Uh, and we know that uh, downstairs, uh, by projecting, F twiddle of B is just equal to H restricted to X cross zero. Uh, that's what the commutativity of the square tells us. So uh, it turns out we can just construct um, this H twiddle by, uh, this is just like kind of silly, but just make H twiddle be F twiddle F uh, for all times on the right. Uh, so uh, how should I, let's give it coordinates. H twiddle of X comma T is F twiddle of x uh, on projected on the f component, and then it's just whatever h is doing of x comma t on the right. Uh, and in particular, we know that at time zero, this guy is uh, f uh, twiddle b at time t equals zero. Uh, so you just restrict the homotopy entirely into the B coordinate and you get a homotopy upstairs. But of course you did need this additional data of um, the map upstairs. Uh, the other example I want to give, uh, and maybe this is just aside, is that uh, uh, path lifting uh, for covering spaces. is just the special case where x is equal to um, a single point. Uh, and so then what you're doing when you path lift is you have, um, I'm just going to use uh, E, P, B. Uh, I tell you where uh, the path starts. So I pick some lift. Um, so if this uh, is like, pick B0 down here. I have a lift of B0 up here. Uh, that the content of zero, telling you where the path starts picks that. And so picking, uh, oh, let's just call it gamma downstairs, picking a path downstairs and then getting this lift subject to a starting condition upstairs is the same sort of data as this homotopy lifting uh, property. So uh, we're actually going to prove uh, this long sex sequence from the relative homotopy lifting property. Uh, and trust me, we're still getting back to fiber bundles. We're just taking a slight detour. Uh, 
Uh, and there is a distinction between a fibration and a fiber bundle, but um, so uh, we need a relative form. So uh, we'll say that um, P has the homotopy lifting property for the pair X comma A. Um, if we have the following sort of lifting diagram, so the idea is, uh, let's still capture it in one big diagram. So if I've got uh, P going from, I already regret my decisions, from E to B, uh, and I've got a homotopy here downstairs of um, all of X cross I, uh, and I have a lifting upstairs, like I have a choice upstairs just for A, uh, and I know where I want to send uh, the rest of X at time zero. Uh, let's call this, uh, think of this as H uh, twiddle for A, uh, union, um, H zero lifted, right? So I've like picked a choice for what's happening at time zero everywhere. And then also given a whole homotopy lift for, uh, my sub, uh, my subspace A, uh, and this clearly includes, um, then I need to get, uh, lift of the whole outside space. So, um, so um, the best example for this uh, is uh, for disks. So the homotopy lifting property for disks. Uh, so what you want to think here is this is for the pair uh, dn relative the boundary of dn for all n. Um, and a map that satisfies the homotopy lifting property for disks. Uh, this is like a side definition. These are serif vibrations. So if you satisfy the homotopy lifting property uh, for every disk, dk, uh, it's the same to do it for these relative pairs. Um, yeah, so maybe. I'm now starting to get delirious. There's only so much talking to an iPad you can do before you get there. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, it is equivalent to say uh, homotopy lifting property for all disks d n and relative homotopy lifting property for all pairs uh, D N relative boundary D N. Uh, and sometimes the latter is easier to think about, uh, but it's really just the fact that, uh, the pairs, um, D N, uh, like if you reduce that relative part down to just a point, so you're only ever giving a lift for, um, a point, then, uh, d n cross i relative uh, d n cross zero uh, is equivalent as pairs uh, to uh, this ugly mess uh, d n cross i relative d uh, n cross zero union boundary d n cross I. Um, uh, and this is, this is a le legit homeomorphism of pairs. Uh, and it's just because this is a deformation retract, um, cause I'm, I'm adding dumb stuff. So, uh, uh, in particular for when N equals one, which is the only case I could maybe even potentially draw, uh, this is, uh, I cross I relative um, this side here, uh, and on this side we have 
i cross i relative uh, the boundary of i cross a homotopy and this, and uh, there's a way to retract those sides down to make these two things equal to each other. And in fact, I think this subtlety came up when we proved um, the existence of the long exact sequence for homotopy groups, so uh, for pairs. So this, this kind of subtlety happens all the time. Um, okay, so let's state uh, the theorem about long exact sequences. And do I have any space left on this page? Yeah, I got tons. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, yeah. so theorem. Uh, if uh, P E to B um, has the homotopy lifting, uh, homotopy lifting property for disks, for all disks, uh, for all n bigger than or equal to zero, uh, and uh, b0 in b is a base point, uh, and we also fix um, x0 in f uh, equal to, let's say, p inverse of b0 um, as a base point Uh, and, um, and also this lives inside of E. So I'm thinking like kind of like compatible base points for all three spaces. Um, then the map, uh, pi N, uh, Pi uh, n, if I fixed my n's, let's use maybe k, because I already used n once, so pi k of uh, e relative to the fiber relative to the base point, uh, mapping to pi k of the base relative its base point, uh, base to its base point, uh, is an isomorphism for all um, n greater than or equal to 1. Uh, and if uh, b is uh, path connected, that means we get a long get Zek sequence uh, of the desired form. So that'll look like pi n of f at x0 to pi n of e at x0, to pi n of b at b0, to uh, pi n minus 1, read that pi of f, b0, blah, 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 uh, and it terminates at pi 0, e uh, x0. Uh, and you don't get the... Uh, the base, because uh, it should just be a single point, which looks like the set zero. So uh, that's what it should look like. So you expect over here on the right-hand side that these the, that the last thing is like a set, and the thing before it's also a set. So you have to interpret the exactness in the same way we did earlier, talking about the long Zeck sequence for pairs in um, homotopy groups. But in general, this homo uh, this version for um, vibrations in particular, and we'll see for fiber bundles, gives us more computational power um, because it tends to relate more interesting spaces than, uh, than the pair case. Oh, and I keep saying pairs, but I mean the, um, the sequence we gave for uh, uh, covering spaces, because we proved this for covering spaces, and now we're extending it to better than covering spaces. So. Um, Okay, so proof. Um, first, P star is on two. So uh, what we should do is uh, pick an element in uh, pi n uh, 
of the base. And I want to be able to produce a lift in um, E relative F. So uh, what I'm going to do is view that as a map from, um, uh, let's use IN for the disk, the boundary of IN, into B relative B0. Uh, OK. And I get to lift this. OK, so what I want to do is think about um, the lifting property I have. And what I'll do is view um, this as part of a homotopy. So view this as i n minus 1 cross i. Uh, here's your map f downstairs. Uh, and you understand what it's doing on the boundary. and Upstairs, I have this, uh, because I have the lifting property for, for this pair, I want to extend it over I um, over J, uh, J n minus 1. Um, so recall that J n minus 1 was inside of I n uh, was like the, the thing we needed to lift for our relative homotopy groups. So relative homotopy groups, if this is i, and uh, jn was that uh, garbage that was allowed to shift in the homotopy. So uh, a homotopy class looks like a map i, n, j, n minus 1, uh, the base point, into uh, like y, a, base point. Why not? All right, something like this. Is an element uh, in pi n y a base point. So what I can do is map uh, j n minus 1 entirely to uh, the uh, base point upstairs. So um, what did I call that? I called that b0 is downstairs, x0 upstairs. Um, and this is, in fact, the relative thing that we wrote down before. Um, boundary i n cross uh, i uh, union i n cross 0, right? Uh, so by the homotopy lifting property, uh, the relative homotopy lifting property for the pair i n relative boundary i n, we get a lift. Uh, and I'm just going to call it f twiddle. And that goes from i, n to e. Uh, and I'm going to draw my little picture here. Uh, so if it's doing, uh, here's my picture of i, n. So it can do uh, f twiddle kind of freely all over, but then it has to be doing um, uh, sending all of this to the base point. All this goes to uh, x0, that's the base point. Uh, and when you map this downstairs via p, this is just all going doing f into b. Um, and the whole boundary is now going to uh, b0 in the base point in b. Right? So. I've produced a lift upstairs for part of this map. Uh, and now it's clear that uh, F twiddle has to live inside of the fiber. Sorry, uh, F twiddle, F twiddle restricted the whole boundary. So here's the, the bit I'm going to highlight. So this guy here has to be mapping to B0. So from this picture, I get to conclude that f twiddle um, restricted to the boundary of i n. Uh, all of this lands inside of uh, the fiber 
which I'm going to write as f, which is always p inverse of the base point. So whenever you fix a base point downstairs, f is going to always be identified with the inverse image of that base point. So now this whole thing looks like a fiber. Uh, and now if you look, f twiddle is totally a homotopy, a relative homotopy class of um, e relative f at, uh, oh, sorry, x0. Uh, a and now p, uh, lower star of f twiddle is f uh, as desired. So that's great. Um, so that's on to, and I also want to prove injectivity. Oh, I, I realized I wrote something wrong, correcting my mistakes. Um, that's not quite what relative homotopy groups look like, and I hate them. Uh, so relative ho homotopy groups um, for y a y not, the requirement is that the boundary of i n will go into a, and the j n minus one part of the boundary will all go to the base point. So you're allowed to like freely twiddle on the top, uh, freely like make that stretchy on the top, um, which agrees with this picture I have down below. So just don't try to remember things; just always follow your nose. That's the moral of this story. Um, okay, so for injectivity, um, proof is really similar. Just assume, um, let's say, uh, f1 and uh, f2 are both elements of uh, pi n, e, f, x naught, and p star of f1 equals p star of f2. Um, I get... You know, I kind of, I'm just giving up on square boxes for homotopy classes of maps. Right, so uh, we have this setup. Uh, that means they're equal downstairs. So let uh, H uh, be a map between the two of them. So H is a homotopy from I n cross I to uh, X. Uh, and it's a homotopy uh, from... Uh, P uh, of F1 to uh, P of P of F2. Uh, great. So what we do is we just lift to demonstrate that the homotopy gets gives us a homotopy upstairs. Uh, and so what I need to do is think about what F1 and F2 are. Those are maps from uh, i n relative the boundary of i n relative j n minus one to e f x naught moving up there um, and so uh, what we notice is that h uh, I'm so I'm looking at like the last coordinate of h um, f one and F2 are kind of like partial lifts. So uh, let's draw my diagram. I want to look at H. I want to go like this. I N cross I H to, um, let's just be clear. This is base. Oh, I used X. Should be using B. Base. Um, uh, let's, you know, let's write it relatively. Uh, I just want to be very clear about where everything's going. So the relative to the boundary of i n uh, cross i, uh, this is going to um, b comma b zero. So the whole boundary has to always go because it's relative. The homotopy is uh, rel, the boundary of i n. Um, so here's p. Here's E, uh, X naught. Um, I have two um, kind of like nice choices. So F1 and F2 give me maps. So 
So I'm gonna kind of assemble this top thing clearly. So F1 gives me a map on I N uh, cross zero, uh, comma, boundary I N cross zero, comma, J N minus one. Uh, to there. Uh, let's honestly let's move this a little bit more. Um, yeah. So here's the domain for F one. Uh, F two gives me one on the same, but for cross one, etc. Uh, and then I also need one in order to get the relative uh, lifting property. Um, and what's it going to look like? Uh, I'm going to give uh, the constant map. So just this choice of base point x0 is what I'm going to do to j uh, n minus 1 cross all of i. Um, in particular, j n minus 1 cross i had to go to... So, just be clear, like, this is a triple. <laughs> uh, all of it is going to the base point, though, right? So, um, yeah, and all of this lives inside of here. Uh, and if you check, this is this last jn minus 1 cross i. Uh, this is close to being the relative uh, lifting property. Like, here's what h is. And the only distinction... What I need to do to be able to get this lift on the nose is I need to um, flip one of these eyes, like the behavior of one of these eyes. So I need to make this, I need to consider this the space uh, i n minus 1 cross that i cross this other i, uh, and then realize that I'm doing the action on that thing there, and then the boundaries start making sense. That, then you can check that this in fact, from the relative homotopy lifting property, I get a lift of H, um, which is doing F1 on the appropriate part of H. Uh, so on F2 on the other part and is constant on the JN minus 1, so it's actually a relative homotopy. So we get H twiddle a relative homotopy. Uh, from uh, F1 to F2, uh, rel j uh, n minus 1, I guess is the way I've written it. And uh, that implies injectivity. Um, oh, uh, that implies injectivity. Do I have more space on this page? Nope. Next page. So uh, just to get the final conclusion, So uh, the final statement, uh, we just use um, the long Zach sequence for the pair. E relative F. Um, and now we have the long Zach sequence using uh, uh, relative homotopy groups. which we definitely proved at the beginning of the section. Uh, and now, uh, in that long Zach sequence of the pair, uh, everywhere I have the relative group, I get to replace it with B, uh, the homotopy groups for the base. Um, yeah, so now uh, it looks kind of like I've got uh, F, which lives inside of E, uh, with this kind of like nice projection to B, uh, giving me this... Uh, Long Zach sequence and homotopy groups, and it looks like pi k f uh, relative x naught this lift to pi k e relative x naught to, and the relative one should be pi k e rel f rel x naught, but we know that's just pi k b rel b naught, and then this is my boundary map going to pi k minus one of f relative x naught. Uh, 
yeah, and that's my conclusion. Um, and I get to use the relative homotopy group thing if uh, B is path connected, because uh, otherwise you don't get the sequence. Uh, at the end, you only really get it on the component of the base point. Uh, and let's see. Yeah, you only get it on the component of the base point in the higher homotopy groups uh, and for um, surge activity uh, on the pi zero part at the end. Uh, but that's that's all going back to the um, long zeg sequence for the pair in homotopy groups that we proved once we defined relative higher homotopy groups. So not too bad. Um, let's finish things. We're so close. Uh, close to the end of the last, last day of class. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is what a fiber bundle is. So, uh, a fiber bundle, uh, is a structure on the space E, on the total space. So, uh, is, uh, data on a space E consisting of uh, a projection P from E to B. Uh, and projection is just the name for the map. I'm just calling it projection. It's not telling you some property of it. Um, and uh, a fiber, which is just a choice of space F. Um, such that for every B in uh, B, for every point B in B, there exists a neighborhood. I probably want this to be open. Why not? Open neighborhood U uh, containing at B downstairs. Uh, for which uh, there exists a homeomorphism H mapping from the inverse image of U to the trivial product U cross F. Uh, and this is supposed to fill uh, the following data. So there exists this map H. Uh, let's write it as a triangle. So here's H uh, such that uh, if I take P inverse of U and I just apply P to get back U, or I apply the projection, uh, this commutes. So uh, it is in fact a uh, it lifts, like, some canonical, let me not say anything too complicated, it's just saying it, uh, it looks like this. So this, in fact, looks like the trivial product. Um, so it carries each, like, point-wise fiber of a point in U to uh, the copy of F upstairs. Uh, and I should note, uh, this homomorphism is called the local trivialization of the fiber bundle. So a fiber bundle is a map which is locally trivializable into a fixed fiber over every point. And what I want to say about fiber bundles is that all of those examples we gave earlier have this property. They have this local triviality property. Uh, so they locally look like a trivial product, but somehow those local bits are glued together into something globally non-trivial or twisted or trivial, right? So trivial projection works too. Um, but you should think that this is uh, the beefed up version of uh, covering spaces. Covering spaces. Just now where our fibers aren't just discrete set of points. So uh, before 
when f is a discrete set of points, then uh, if our downstairs space looks something like this, then upstairs you have to have a stack of pancakes for your fiber over a bunch of points. Uh, and then as you're moving, it could be that these are like permuting, following some sort of action of pi one. So as you move around the space, there's, you know, some wiggliness that causes the, uh, the thing in this map to, to change as you, as you move. So, uh, but you have this local triviality property. So locally, it can always be resolved to look just like a stack of pancakes. Uh, and that's the same, just now I'm allowed to be crossed with F, not just a discrete space, but something more uh, with some structure to it. So um, the, the one tie it all together takeaway, now that you have all these examples, including all the Hopf maps and higher dimensions also work, um, is that fiber bundles are examples of vibrations. So let's, uh, let's prove that. So scroll down. Hmm, I got enough space. So uh, theorem. Theorem. Uh, yeah, so a fiber bundle. Uh, F E B E P to B. Uh, and just in case it was not clear earlier, this is always called the fiber. This is always called the total space. And this is always called the base space. Uh, that looks good, um, is, uh, or sorry, has the homotopy lifting property, uh, for any CW pair X, A, um, and therefore it is a serif vibration. Uh, let's just say this is corollary. Uh, fiber bundles E, P, and B are serif vibrations. Hence, uh, if B is path connected, we get a long exact sequence in uh, homotopy groups. So let's prove the theorem and we'll be done. So the key to this proof is noticing that uh, CW complexes are just made of disks. So we only need to lift a homotopy for a single cell uh, or just for a single cube. So um, it's equivalent to uh, have the homotopy lifting property for all uh, CW pairs uh, as it is to have it for all um, disks. Once I know I can lift disk attaching maps, that's, or lift, lift disks, that's all I actually need to do. So uh, I'm just going to do it for, um, for disks. So, and by disks, I'm gonna just gonna replace those by cubes. So uh, let's start uh, with a homotopy of a cube. So let G be, um, you know what, let me, let's put G down here. Uh, it's gonna be a map between a cube, a homotopy on a cube uh, to um, my base space, B. Uh, and here's my map P going up to my total space E. So what I can do is uh, subdivide my cube sufficiently so that uh, every little subcube lands in one of these uh, little open covers. So uh, uh, pick um, a... Uh, 
open cover of B by um, trivialized uh, sets U, i.e. where uh, P is locally trivial. on each U. So uh, I'm now viewing B uh, as a big union of uh, U alphas or some alpha, right? Uh, and what I'll do is subdivide I n cross I uh, into cubes. Uh, so that uh, each subcube uh, lands in some U alpha entirely. Uh, and uh, because I is compact, I know that I can pick some finite uh, subdivision that make this, this work. Uh, and so your picture for this might be like you started with uh, in the picture I can draw, so when n equals 1, it's going to look something like I took this, and I have now subdivided it into little subcubes, and each of these is small enough, and now I'm going to uh, lift the homotopy over each one of these separately. Uh, so I'm going to lift it over this one first, and then this one, and this one, etc., and just kind of like move up the whole cube. Uh, so, uh, since we have a finite number of cubes, uh, uh, and I'm going to call each subcube, let's just call it um, C sub T, living inside of uh, hi n cross i, uh, we'll do the homotopy, uh, we'll lift over um, C T on uh, the time interval, uh, oh, I should do like 1 over w 1 over t to 1 over t plus 1, or whichever way I should make this work, right? That's totally fine, so I'll do, I'll do them all kind of backwards. Um, so how this works is I'll um, uh, assume uh, inductively that I've given lifts of all the boundaries. So by uh, induction on n that uh, we, we have a lift, um, g twiddle, uh, lifting from uh, on each uh, boundary of a cube for all time t. So in other words, in this picture, we have uh, the fills on all of the grid lines, but we don't have the fills on the two-dimensional cubes filling them. Uh, and then we can just use um, u where it's been trivialized and the uh, canonical lifting for the trivialization to get a lifting just over that time. So Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, on CT, we have a map from CT, uh, boundary CT. Sorry, let me um, give myself a little bit of breathing space. So on CT, here's how we do the lift. We know how to lift G twiddle on the boundary. Uh, uh, so let's just call this G twiddle on the boundary of CT um, into uh, a total space. Uh, and I know that, in fact, CT uh, is running into uh, entirely U. So let's factor this. Uh, CT lands in U for alpha, for some alpha, uh, indexed by T. Um, which lives inside of the base, right? And we know how this 
uh, lift works on the whole boundary. Uh, and in fact, E all over U alpha just looks like uh, F cross U alpha at time T. Uh, and so this concludes into here. And because uh, CT land, the boundary of CT lands in U, uh, I actually know that the boundary of CT uh, lift upstairs has to land in this fiber. Uh, and so here's where P has been trivialized. Uh, so because it's trivialized, I can just pick my CT uh, map upstairs to be do, um, just do whatever you're doing downstairs in the UT coordinate and do the boundary G on F and don't change as, uh, as you indu induct over time. Uh, and I think it, you see that right now, what I actually have to do is, uh, rather than needing the definition on the whole boundary, what I do is I replace that with um, just the part of the boundary that I care about. So view this as, um, uh, because this is isomorphic to a little i n cross i, uh, then the part that I care about, I'm just gonna only contain uh, contain like guppy of j. So I know what the lift is on um, uh, boundary of i n uh, cross i, and on uh, i n cross zero. Uh, so this is how I define I, and then that looks good. Uh, and by the lifting property over here on the left, because this thing is trivialized, I already know for trivial things I can get this lift on all of CT. Uh, and then you just inductively do this uh, for each of the pieces. So notice, though, that when I do this, what you're kind of doing is you've... Um, you took this little square and uh, you fixed what it's doing on these sides and then you got a new lift to fill in what's happening on all of that. Uh, and then you inductively go on to your next one where you fix what it's doing on these sides and you fill in all of this. And now you want to just put these in an order however the T ordering works out, so that next you go along and you inductively start with the data of this extra filling side. So I want to like highlight this side right here, uh, and then, uh, then you fill with that data for this cube to get this one, and you keep doing that going up. So you assume you can do the fillings on all the boundaries, but then you kind of like inductively fill them in and keep tweaking them with each time to um, get the extension. So that's what the argument looks like. Uh, and for people who were around last semester, you might remember that we basically use the same argument to do homotopy lifting. You always just subdivide your paths into short enough time intervals that you can lift what's happening on that short time interval through because it's uh, trivially covered. And so you know that you're in you know what's happening kind of at one of the endpoints and you just are forced to lift under the homeomorphism. So this kind of trivialization uh, is already telling us what's going on in the F coordinate uh, under this, this pick, because this direction is like the F direction uh, and this direction is like my um, U alpha T direction. Yeah, if that makes any more sense. Um, and so that's that. Uh, so as I said earlier, um, sorry about the delay, next week I'll publish a um, video about Sarah spectral sequence and fit some calculations into that, and it might be slightly less rigorous and more motivational, but we'll definitely do some computations of uh, homology of loop groups, and it will be pretty useful. So 